أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين In the last session we discussed a few verses from the Holy Quran which are interpreted to be as an allusion to the time of Mahdi alayhi salam and now briefly in this session we will uh, go through a few traditions as I said before the traditions about Mahdi is so abundant that we cannot of course cover all of them some of them inshallah we will discuss when we are going to uh, to deal with other things like time of his coming, uh, how the situation will be when he comes, and uh, the importance of uh, uh, the Ashrat al Sa'a, importance of the uh, end of the time. Uh, and some, of course, we have to leave out for your own study. Now, today we deal with two sets of traditions. One tradition which have an indirect implication uh, for Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and others just a few traditions which have a very direct implication uh, towards him. I have chosen these traditions mainly from Sunni sources because uh, there's no use bringing the traditions from our own Shia sources because it is really taken for granted. That is a common uh, consensus of all Shias about the issue and the traditions in our sources really abounds and it's very difficult to uh, to choose one at the expense of the other. Now the hadith on Mahdi alayhi salam, the traditions in this respect could be divided to two groups. The traditions with indirect implication indicating the presence of an Imam or a Khalifa at all times. Now again, as I said, this I uh, would like to quote from uh, our Sunni sources rather than our, our Shia sources. When I say our Sunni sources, because Sunni sources do not belong to Sunnis only, it belongs to us as well. Because that is the, the wealth of Islamic uh, heritage which is remained behind for all of us. So I would not like to say these are Sunni sources, these are Shia sources, these are the sources that of course we look into them differently and the Shia sources we look into differently but all of, all of them belongs to all. So our Sunni sources on the issue of Khilafah. Then the traditions which directly refer to Mahdi, this is uh, the second batch. Now, Sahih al-Bukhari and Jabir ibn Sumara. Jabir, Jabir ibn Sumara was a, probably a minor companion of the Prophet. We have two sets of companions, so to speak, minor companions and major companions. Minor companions are those companions who were very young at the time of the Prophet. Since Jabir ibn Samara has died at the year 66, so probably Prophet peace be on him died at the age, uh, at 11 after Hijra, so he lived 55 years after the Prophet peace be on him, therefore he should have been very young. We don't know when he was, he was born, but he should have been very young at, at, at that time, 20, 25 years old maximum. He says, سَمِئْتُ النَّبِي يَقُولْ يَكُونُ إِثْنَا أَشَرَ أَمِيرًا فَقَالَ كَلِمَةً لَمْ أَسْمَعْهَا فَقَالَ أَبِي إِنَّهُ يَقُولْ كُلُّهُمْ مِنْ قُرَيْشٍ Now, the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari from Jabir ibn Samura who said, uh, I heard the Prophet saying there will be 12 leaders. Then he said a word I did not hear. I asked my father and he said the Prophet says all of them are from Quraysh. Now, these Amirs or Khulafa or A'imma being from Quraysh was something very famous at that time. And uh, 
actually, you know, there was a dispute between Muhajirun and Ansar after the Prophet that who should become a caliph. After, of course, according to our version of the history, they had taken for granted that they are not going to give that to Ali, peace be on him. Then they argued, okay, who should be caliph? And Ansar were on, on one side and Muhajirun were on the other side. And at the end they said, okay, minna amir wa minkum amir. Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, the head of Ansar, he said, okay, one leader from us, one leader from you. If you insist that you want to be caliph after the Prophet, why Muhajir, why not Ansar? And then a hadith was brought up by Abu Bakr and his group that they heard the Prophet saying, al ummatu min Quraysh, the Imams should be from Quraysh. And then Ansar admitted that they had heard this from the Prophet, peace be on him. And uh, in this way, they said, because Nahnu Qurba Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are the closest relatives of the Prophet, peace be on him. And therefore, we should be the leaders. When it is very ironic that when this uh, incident reached Amir al Mu'minin Ali alayhi salam, he laughed that how they defeated Ansar. And he said, فَإِن كُنْتَ بِالْبِشُورَى غَلَبْتَ أُمُورَهُمْ فَكَيْفَ بِذَلَكَ وَالْمُشِيرُونَ غُيَّبُ If it was a shura, if it was a big consulting group, you were a small group in Saqifah. How you say that it was the shura? وَإِن كُنْتَ بِالْقُرْبَى حَجَجْتَ خَسِيمَهُمْ فَغَيْرُكَ and if you said you were relatives of the Prophet, there were others who were closer to the Prophet than you. So this is history. We don't want to discuss about it. That's, let's leave that alone. But this Aimma min Quraysh is something which is unanimously accepted by Shias and Sunnis. Now, let's see those who say who are after Khilafah nowadays. We have many Sunni, very zealous Sunni uh, public who say we want to establish Khilafah. Okay, who should be a Khalif? Who should be Khalifa, a Caliph? Well, the Prophet said, al min Quraysh, the Imam should be from Quraysh. Okay, where do you want to find an Imam from Quraysh? Who you go to? If you want to do it by consultation, by al hal al aqd everyone in the world should look after someone from Quraysh. The same thing that uh, Abd Khaldun was saying that if Mahdi comes, where are Banu Fatima who want to support him? Now, the meaning of this Kulluhum min Quraysh, because Prophet didn't want to very specifically mention they are from Banu Hashim and from my own house at that stage. He just wanted to allude to the fact that there are 12 leaders after me and they are from Quraysh. They are from, and we don't know. I mean, why Jabir had not heard what Prophet had said? Did Jabir's father had heard, did he hear correctly, saying that they are from Quraysh? Or Prophet said something else? We don't know. We don't want to discuss that. However, the hadith is unanimously accepted that the Prophet said there are 12 leaders after me. I heard the Prophet saying there will be 12 leaders after me. Okay, this is one hadith. This was in Sahih al-Bukhari. Then, this hadith has been reported from Jabir in various forms through many different chains of transmission. It is not only, of course, Bukhari who reports this hadith. In his Musnad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, has reported variants of this hadith from Jabir through 34 chains. And since Jabir was a companion, and therefore, according to our Sunni standards of hadith, this hadith should be accepted with no, without question. And since it's in Bukhari, it's in other books. Uh, in Mustad Ahmad, one of the uh, chains he brings from Sha'bi from Jabir ibn Samura قَالَ سَمِئْتُ النَّبِيَّ قُولْ يَكُونُ لُحَاذِهِ الْأُمَّةِ 
Isna Ashara Khalifa He uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal from Jabir ibn Samura said that I heard the Prophet saying there will be 12 Khalifas for this Ummah Now why I'm mentioning this because these allude indirectly as I will discuss to the idea of Mahdi alayhi salam Other variants of this hadith are reported in various books of hadith including in Sahih al-Tirmidhi yakunu now I, I mention just the nuances of the tradition yakunu min ba'di ithna ashara amiran there will be 12 leaders after me also in Sahih muslim Kitab al-Imara inna hadha al-amr la yanqadi hatta yamdhi fihim ithna ashara khalifatan this affair that means Islam will not come to an end until 12 Khalifas pass in them. Now, this is very interesting because it talks about a continuation and that this will not come to an end until these 12 would rule in this Ummah. Now another variant again in Sahih Muslim لا يزال أمر الناس ماضيا ما وليهم إثنى عشر رجلا The affairs of people will continue to pass so long as 12 men rule over them. It's after these 12 men we don't know what will happen to people. But so long as these 12 people has not, have not ruled then uh, the, the, the Ummah will continue to, to exist. Now, this is another hadith, not from Jabir ibn Samura. This is specifically very interesting hadith. Again, and the Shabi, this is in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, and Masruq. Qala. كنا جلوسا عند عبد الله بن مسعود وهو يقرأنا القرآن We were sitting round Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and he was teaching us the Quran. Now, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was one of those four leading companions who was the scholar in Quran. Certainly, not all companions were scholars of Quran. It's very natural. Uh, Although the companions had seen the Prophet, had heard the Prophet, sometimes the Prophet recited revelations for them, but it was just, for example, like if we are city, living with the Prophet in one city, and sometimes we see him reciting a verse of the Qur'an, and occasionally we memorize it. But we do not become scholars of the Qur'an. That's very natural, and therefore not all companions of the Prophet were scholars of the Qur'an. Now usually the, uh, the scholars of Ulum al-Qur'an, they say there were ten companions who were point of reference when a question came about the Qur'an. And these companions are mentioned. However, they say most of, them, most of these ten also knew the Qur'an partially, not wholly. Because first of all, they were not with the Prophet right from the beginning. Secondly, they didn't have that scholarly skills about the Asbab al-Nuzul and uh, when a verse was revealed, what did it allude to? There were only four companions. What I'm saying here is not the view of the Shia or a part of the Ummah. It is unanimously accepted by all the scholars of Ulum al-Quran that there were four scholars four companions who were regarded to be scholars of the Qur'an. That means anyone having any question about a word of the Qur'an, a verse of the Qur'an, explanation, whether this was really Qur'an or not Qur'an, when was this revealed, they refer to these four. And these four were, well, the leading one was Ali ibn Abi Talib, the teacher of the other three, and Ubayy ibn Ka'b, and 
Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and Abdullah ibn Abbas. Of course, Abdullah ibn Abbas was a junior companion, a minor companion, so to speak, and he was a student of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, so Abdullah ibn Mas'ud here that we are talking about, he was that scholar of the Quran who had come from Iraq to, to where this hadith actually was transmitted. We don't know where is this. Oh, I didn't make much investigation where this conversation uh, uh, took part. Now, he, Masruq, says, we were sitting around Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Quran. he was teaching us Quran. فَقَالَ لَهُ رَجُلٌ يَا أَبَا عَبْدِ الرَّحْمَانِ هَلْ سَأَلْتُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ كَمْ يَمْلِكُ هَذِهِ الْأُمَّ مِنْ خَلِيفَةِ so we were sitting with Abdullah ibn Masood and he was teaching us the Quran when a man asked him, Oh Abu Abdullah, did you ever ask the Messenger of God how many Khalifas will rule this Ummah? Now, from this hadith and from the previous tradition, we realize that this concept of Khalifa, leader after the Prophet, was something well known. Prophet, peace be on him, had talked about it, had talked about Khalifa. That after me there will be 12 Khalifa. Now, not in any way we want to discuss now who did, appoint, who did the Prophet appoint, who did he mention, but the very idea of Khilafah, of leadership after the Prophet. Here Masruh asked Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, did you ever ask the Messenger of God how many Khalifas will rule this Ummah? He said, no one has asked me about this before you since I arrived from Iraq. Now even Abdullah ibn Masood was taken by surprise here. That's how come these things are not discussed anymore after the prophets. You know Abdullah ibn Masood had his own special way. Rahmatullah alayhi was a great, great, great companion. He had his own special ways. And Asking Abdullah ibn Masood about this shows that he was known, that he, he used to talk about these things. So, he says that no one had asked me, no one probably had dared to ask me about these issues of Khilafah and whether Prophet peace be on him had mentioned anything about the number. Then he said, yes, we asked the Prophet about this and he said 12 as the number of the leaders of Bani Israel, Fakala Ithna Ashara, Kaeddat Nukaba, Ebani Israel. Twelve Khalifas. Now, suppose you are a Sunni scholar, just any one of you, ladies and men from Sunni scholars, how do you interpret these? How do you interpret these? Any idea? The Sunni scholars have tried to find different explanations for these traditions. However, just like you, with no avail. At the end, they have said that we don't know the meaning of these traditions. Well, they, some of them have said, uh, few have provided few explanations, but at the end they have said we had to leave this, we have to leave the knowledge of this tradition, because the traditions could not be certainly rejected. It's in Sahih, it's in Sahih Muslim, Sahih Bukhari, it's reported from through many chains. So what they say is that we leave the knowledge of this to Allah, we don't know what does it mean. Twelve Khalifas. Now, some of them have tried to say, for example, okay, we just count the Khulafa after the Prophet until Sulaiman of Banu Umayya and we stop. That's 12. This includes Yazid as well. Well, you know how, what, what type of interpretation this might be of this tradition. Asuyuti, the, of course, great scholar, Maliki scholar, he says that, okay, let's say the Prophet didn't mean that they are going to rule one after another. He might have meant that there would be 12 real Khalifas up to the end of the top. And then he says, okay, we, we count the four first Caliphs, and then we say Hassan ibn Ali, 
five, Muawiyah, six. And how could the caliphs after the Prophet fight against each other? Why Muawiyah fought against Ali or Ali fought against Muawiyah? That's another issue. Just, then he says, okay, we count Umar ibn Abdul Aziz because he was the most pious Khalifa of Banu Umayyah. And we count Mahdi of Banu Abbas because he was also someone somehow pious. Okay, this is how, how many? Six. Hmm? Is it six or seven? Seven. This is seven. He says, okay, the rest might have, might haven't, might have not come yet. But certainly Mahdi is one of them, he says. So that's eight. The other four, the knowledge of it, we leave it to posterities to find out. We don't know who they are, these twelve caliphs. Now, we have a very straightforward explanation for these traditions. Yes, there were twelve leaders. All of them were from the Quraysh, of course, the bigger circle of Banu Hashem, the bigger tribe. And uh, it's very straightforward that one of these is Mahdi, because according to our version of the history, 11 of these Khalifas, or leaders, have already passed. And there is only one more left, which will come, and that is Imam al-Mahdi. There is no plausible, therefore, there is no plausible explanation for this tradition, except the Shi explanation of the 12 Imams. That is what we conclude. Now, try to be fair, any other explanation you can think about? Or oh, you don't want to think about any other explanation. It's blasphemy, isn't it, to think about any other explanation. Okay. So, this is one tradition which indirectly indicates the coming of Mahdi alayhi salam. This event, this issue of Islam, would not come to an end until 12 leaders would rule. And we know that 11 leaders have already, already ruled. By ruling here we don't mean only political dominance and sovereignty. They have been the leaders of the Ummah, although the Ummah rejected them. They were the real leaders of the Ummah. And there is one left, and that one should come. When? We don't know. Inshallah, before these lectures finish. Now, uh, Okay. Another tradition which has a, an indirect implication here. Man mata walam ya'rif imam zamanihi ma tamitatan jahiliyah. Whoever dies without knowing his imam of the time has died a death of ignorance, jahiliyah. Now, jahiliyyah refers to the time before Islam because that word, jahil, is ignorance, and jahiliyyah is the, the time of ignorance, the occasion of ignorance. And because people didn't know about God, how to worship Him, how to approach Him, what type of standards they follow in their lives, therefore, this is called time of ignorance, jahiliyyah. Now, no matter whether you are a Muslim or not a Muslim, no matter you have followed the Prophet or not, if you do not know who is the leader of your time after the Prophet, you have died death of ignorance. That doesn't mean that God would take you to hell. Because we don't believe that anyone died at the time of ignorance would go to hell. These are Mustad Afun. Mustad Af is someone who hasn't got guidance. And therefore they even don't have the... Su'al al even Nakir and Munkar would, wouldn't go and ask them anything. Because if they ask them something, they say, what are you talking about? You don't know. No one came to us. No one told us. So they, they don't have, as according to a hadith from Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, these people have no question of grave as well. How will God, God judge them, inshallah, on the day of judgment? We don't know. So, when we say, Man mata wa lam ya'rif imam zamani hi mata it doesn't mean that they go to hell. It means that they are at ignorance. Still, still the same ignorance as they were before the Prophet. This is the implication of the hadith. Now, this hadith has been reported profusely in Shia sources. Like Al-Kafi, Al-Mahasin, Al-Basair, Basair al-Darajat, and uh, other books. But, some Sunni sources have reported this variant of tradition. 
However, some of our Sunni scholars have tried, have actually very vehemently have said that this is a fabrication, this is not a true hadith. We reject it, okay. We just put this as a hadith aside. We don't want to discuss this hadith. Even uh, a Sheikh Al Albani, of whom we talked about before, who uh, has very vehemently supported tradition, the traditions of Mahdi, has said that this is a false hadith. Okay, we take his word. According to their sources, this is not right. Fair enough. However, now there are other variants of this hadith which are reported and accepted, has been accepted. It is also reported in this wording in some Sunni books like Musnad al Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Of course, Ahmad ibn Hanbal has brought in his Musnad many traditions, and that's why sometimes they, this is very interesting, sometimes they accused him of being Shia. Okay. Now, it's reported in Musnad Ahmad ibn Hanbal, Sahih ibn Habban, and others, and some Sunni scholars nonetheless, nonetheless have tried to undermine its reliability. We put it aside. However, other variants of the hadith are beyond doubt, even among Sunni scholars, like the hadith in Sahih Muslim, which is accepted unanimously. Now, what is the hadith? Man mata wa laysa fi unuqihi bay'atun ma tamitatan jahiliya. Now, what, 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 what does it mean? This is Abdullah ibn Umar reporting from the Prophet. Whoever dies without an allegiance to an Imam has died a death of ignorance. Now, this hadith is beyond doubt. It's in Sahih Muslim. And many other books have reported this from Abdullah ibn Umar. Now, they take it that, okay, if there is a Muslim leader, we have to give bay'ah. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be left without the bay'ah. مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَيْسَ فِي أُنُقِهِ بَيْعَةٌ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَّةٌ Whoever dies without an allegiance to an imam has died a death of ignorance. It's very interesting. Abdullah ibn Umar did not pay allegiance neither to, Umar, to Muawiyah nor to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was without allegiance for all those times, although he had heard this hadith. And this is why they called him and Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas and some others to be Mu'tazilah. Some people say that the beginning of the term Mu'tazilah comes from here. Although, of course, that's a theological issue. It comes later on at the time of Wasil ibn Atta. However, some people have said that the origin of the term Mu'tazila was coming from these companions who refrained from paying allegiance either to Ali or to Muawiyah and they just went aside, isolated themselves, i'tazal, they were Mu'tazila. Now, however, towards the end of his, ta his life, he became very conscience of this tradition. And they say that when, when Abdullah ibn Zubair was killed, Abdullah ibn Umar was looking for an imam to pay allegiance to. And he couldn't find anyone by Hajjaj, but, but Hajjaj ibn Yusuf in, in Iraq. And he went to him, he said, give me your hand, I want to pay bay'ah because I heard the Prophet man mata wa laysa fi unuqihi bay'ah ma tamitatun jahiliya. And he was an old companion. Even if Hajjaj didn't like him, he should have respected him, but he didn't. What he said, he said, my hands are busy, take my leg and make a bay'ah with me. Just humiliated him. Anyhow, this is history. We don't want to talk about it. But the consciousness of consciousness of Abdullah ibn Umar about this tradition that whoever dies without an allegiance now there is no is there no imam for Muslims now are all Muslims now around the world dying meet at on Jahiliya so it cannot be or the Prophet should have specified this that until certain time, until the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, for example, 
If you die without a bay, you die mita tun jahari, after that you are free. He did not specify. And therefore, we have to take the implications of this hadith seriously. That there should be an imam at every time, at all times. And anyone dying without an allegiance, that allegiance might not be by hand. But we recite every morning, Allahumma hadhi bay'atun lahu fi unuqi. I renew my bay'ah with my imam. Every morning we recite in, in this uh, res- uh, dua of Imam Zamana alayhi salam. So, there should be. Uh, now, in Mustad Ahmad, Wasahih ibn Abban, again we have another variant. Man mata bighayr imamin mata mitatan jahiliya. Whoever dies without an imam has died. A death of ignorance. Now, so these were the traditions with indirect implication. Any question or comment about these? Now, the traditions with direct implication. Now, I have just selected a few traditions here with direct implication uh, on Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. Those which are very abundantly reported in different sources. Again, as I said, I have not chosen anything from our Shia sources, I have chosen from our Sunni sources. Hadith Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiyallahu anhu qala qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam la tanqad dunya hatta yamlik al-arab rajulun min ahli bayti yuwatu ismuhu ismi rawahu al-tarmadhi wa Abu Dawud. This is in Sunan al-Tarmadhi wa Sunan Abu Dawud. Both, both books are from the Sahah of, from Sahah of Sitt. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud from the Prophet, peace be on him. The world would not end before a man from my Ahlul Bayt rules over all Arab, whose name is as mine. So this is one, one variant of, of this, or one of these many, many traditions which have come about Mahdi alayhi salam. The other one is Hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiyallahu anh. These are, of course, honorable companions of the Prophet Abu Sa'id, Ibn Mas'ud. Uh, of course, our view about the companions of the Prophet is very, very clear. The Shia view about the companions of the Prophet. They are honorable men who, without whose help, Prophet, peace be on him, could not have accomplished what he accomplished. If it was not for these companions of the Prophet, peace be on him, we wouldn't have been Muslims now. It was because of them, because of their support, because of the Ansar, because of the Muhajirun, because of as al-awwalun min al-Muhajirin wal-Ansar, that now we are Muslims. There is no doubt about it. However, we do not make sweeping judgment saying that, therefore, Anyone who ever has met the Prophet while believing in him should be an immaculate person. No. Of course, there were many, a minority of these uh, companions who did bad things. For example, Amir al muminin fought against Muawiyah. It, it is not possible that both of them were right. One companion should have been right, one should have been wrong. Two rights, or both of them should have been wrong. Isn't it? But the two haq would not fight against each other. It's not possible. Now, when we talk about the companions uh, in our Nahjul Balaqa lectures, if you remember, we, re- we mentioned from Ibn Abil Hadid, which he, he reported from the history of, uh, of Battle of Safin, that on the side of Amir al Mu'minin in Safin, there were 18,000 of Muhajirun wal Ansar. And on the side of Muawiyah, there were four or five. So you can now judge what percentage of the companions we are talking about when we talk about Haq and Batil. So, of course, our respect for companions cannot be underestimated. And also, we have this dua in Sahifa Sajjadiyah, one dua specifically dedicated by Imam Zainullah alayhi salam, 
to the companions of the Prophet, peace be on him. That's, oh God, send your greetings to the companions of the Prophet who sacrificed whatever they had for the Prophet, peace be on him, to support his cause, to support Islam. Now, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, a great companion of the Prophet, قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم المحدي مني مني means Mahdi is from my blood is from my family أجل الجبه أقن العنف يملأ الأرض قسطا وعذلا كما ملأت جورا وظلما يملك سبع سنين رواه أبو داود وغيره Khudri Mahdi is from me. He's, that means my descendant. With broad forehead and bent nose, as if Prophet was looking to his face now. Uh, this is Mahdi. This is how his face would look like. Aqnal ajlal jabha aqnal anf. Broad forehead and bent nose, he will fill the earth with justice and equity. After he is filled with injustice and oppression, he will, he will rule seven years. Now, when we come to that time, to the end of our lecture, we are discussing the, uh, the events of the time of Mahdi, inshallah, we will discuss this. Okay, how many years will he rule? There are differences in traditions here about the, the, the years in which he will rule. Now we leave this as this hadith mentions it, that he will rule seven years. Yamliku Sabasinin. The other tradition, Hadith Umm Salama Radiallahu Anha, the Umm al the wife of the Prophet, Kala Samit to Rasulallah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Ali wa Salam Yaqul Al Mahdi Min Etrati Min Wulda Fatima. Again, Abu Dawood. So this is from a Sahih book of our Sunni sources. That Mahdi is from my family, from the progeny of the Fatima. This, I think, when we were discussing about the doubts about Mahdi, we mentioned that it is unanimously held. If there is a Mahdi, it's from, well, the Fatima. It's from the descendants of Fatima, so from uh, the Ahlul Bayt, or as the Prophet mentioned in a more general term, min Qurayshin, they should be all from Quraysh, and he, this man is from Quraysh, from Banu Hashim, from Wuld Fatima. Okay. Hadith Ali radiyallahu an, of course we say alayhi salam, our Sunni brothers say radiyallahu an, no problem, because we believe that Allah is already pleased with him. We don't say radiyallahu an, we say alayhi salam. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, al-mahdi minna ahla al-bayt yuslihuhu Allah fi laylatin. This is very beautiful, the way the Prophet has explained this. Rawahu Ahmad wa ibn Majah, na Ahmad ibn Hanbal in Musnad, an ibn Majah in his sunan. Ibn Majah is again one of those who has, who is the author of one of the Sahih of the six Sahih books of Ahlul Sunnah. Now, Mahdi is from us, Ahlul Bayt. Allah will fix his affair in one night. What does it mean? Anyone knows? Allah? Hmm? Promptly. promptly. But what does it mean, promptly? Of course, I mean, there will be preparations for it over long centuries, but it says, Allah yuslihu hullah fi laylatin in, in one night. It means that he is informed in the evening that tomorrow you come out. He doesn't know when he is coming. He doesn't know when is the time. And if he doesn't know, certainly no one else would know. It means that in the Asr, for example, Imam al-Asr salam prays his Asr, he doesn't know that tomorrow is the time of his reappearance. Just in the evening Allah informs him and prepares everything for him, and he should prepare everything in one night for tomorrow to come out. 
So yuslihullah fi layla. So, and this wants to say that uh, it is not just a usual affair. It's something that Allah will do for him. Allah will make everything, will fix everything for him very quickly. In one night everything will be prepared for his reappearance and he will come. The other tradition, hadith, again Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. Anna Rasulullah, or Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam qal, yakhruju fi akhir ummati al-Mahdi. At the end of my ummah, at the end of the time of my ummah, Mahdi will come. Yusqiyuhu Allahu al-Ghaythah. وتخرج الأرض نباتها وتخرج الأرض نباتها ويؤت المال سحاحا وتكثر الماشية وتعظم الأمة يعيش سبعا أو ثمانيا This is in أستدرك الحاكم and الذهب also agrees that this is a sahih hadith Mahdi advances at the end of my ummah Allah satiates him with rain that means the rain would abound at his time there is no famine anymore no dry years anymore it's all good years when he rules and the earth would bring about would bring about would bring out its vegetation there's no shortage he distributes, when we come to Shia traditions, of course, we see that there is much more to this when he comes, inshallah. He distributes the wealth equally. The livestock abound and the ummah becomes big. He lives seven or eight years. So this is another hadith from Mustadrakul Hakim. We break here now and then, inshallah, we do the salat and come back. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Just uh, a few minutes more of these traditions and then we will have a few minutes for discussion, inshallah. Now, the last hadith that we discussed was from Abi Sa'id al-Khudri who said, Mahdi advances at the end of my ummah. Allah satiates him with rain and the earth would bring out its vegetation. He distributes the wealth equally. The livestock abound and the omar becomes big. He lives seven or eight years. This was the last hadith we discussed. Now, there are some doubts around these traditions. Again, doubts coming from human mind people who are somehow against these traditions because these might prove other things as well have raised some doubt about these traditions not specifically about these ones, about the totality of the traditions that we discussed and some of them of course we discussed before and we mentioned where the doubt comes from however let's look at this one oops done it the wrong way now, these were but a sample of traditions about Mahdi. Some have tried to undermine these traditions by the fact that they do not appear in the two books of Al-Bukhari and Muslim. Specifically these traditions. We are not talking about that Mammata wa laysa fi unuqihi bay'a. Of course that was there. These traditions are specifically talking about Mahdi coming at the end of the time. They say if they were correct, they should have appeared in Bukhari and Muslim, and they have not appeared. This type of criticism against traditions uh, probably started by Ibn Taymiyyah, because he wanted to criticize and damn many, many different uh, beliefs which believed among Muslims, which uh, existed among Muslims, generally, not only Shias, he started to doubt any tradition which was not in Bukhari and Muslim, as if the whole heritage of Muslim traditions from the Prophet, peace be on him, was only limited to Bukhari and Muslim.
and you would see if you refer to books of Ibn Taymiyyah he would say in many places that this hadith has not appeared in Bukhari and Muslim the shaykhan have not mentioned this tradition therefore it is not sahih now this is a great uh, challenge here that Ibn Taymiyyah and some other scholars make against the huge heritage that we have from the Prophet who do not appear in Bukhari and Muslim. Now, such a criticism is not valid, certainly. Since the two sheikhs, Muslim and Bukhari, did not claim that they exhaustively collected all Sahih traditions in their books, they never claimed that. They said this is a sample of the traditions that we regard to be Sahih. And especially the very title of the book of Bukhari is what? al jam al Mukhtasaru Sahih. This is a book, Jam means a book which deals with all aspects of what it what a book of tradition should deal with, like history, like tafsir, like uh, uh, sunan of the prophet, like fiqh. But he said this is mukhtasar. This is something I have chosen from the pool of the Sahih traditions that I have with me. Now, Imam Ibn Salah is the authority in ulum al-hadith both in the Sunni world and the Shia world. Of course, previously we didn't have this uh, sort of differentiation between scholars when it came to pure sciences of, uh, of Hadith or Quran. I mean, most Sunni, most Shiite scholars have deferred to ulum al-Hadith of our Sunni scholars and all Sunni scholars have deferred to ulum al-Qur'an, to Shia scholars. You know that the Qur'an which is presently being recited by all Muslims is halves from Asim, and both of them were Shi. So all Muslims have actually uh, deferred to Shia scholars in that matter. And of course Sunni scholars, Ibn Salah is an, the authority, so to speak, in ulum al-Hadith. He says, لم يستوعبا الصحيح في صحيحهما البخاري والمسلم did not exhaustively collect all Sahih traditions in their books and they did not set this task for themselves they never said that, they never claimed on the contrary البخاري is reported to have said that I did not collect in my book but what is Sahih and left out part of Sahih for the fear of length to make it shorter so I did not bring all Sahih in my book. And therefore, it's not a, a valid argument to say that since this hadith does not exist in Bukhari, it's not Sahih, it's not correct. And Muslim is reported to have said that I have not put in this book all that I have collected from Sahih traditions. It was not possible. And after all, many of our Sunni scholars have criticized those who blindly just say whatever is in Bukhari or Muslim is Sahih. It's not correct. Many of Sunni scholars have criticized this. And, well, between ourselves, how can we believe in some of the traditions which have come up in Bukhari, which contradicts all rules of reason? Like, for example, when Malik al came to take the life of Musa, he slapped him in a way that his eyes bulged out and he went to God and complained to God that look, this man doesn't let me to take his life. How can we believe in this? And some of the traditions, if we believe that means the Quran is muharraf, is distorted. Like for example the hadith that uh, Aisha Umm al muminin reports that there were some verses uh, about the times of sucklings uh, for, uh, for this Radai uh, relationship that uh, were in the Quran but a goat came and ate it and therefore we don't have it in the Quran anymore. It was written somewhere and a goat came and ate it. How can we believe in this? This means the Quran is incomplete. So, looking at these traditions, our Sunni scholars, those who criticize 
the books of tradition have said that certainly not everything in Bukhari and Muslim could be Sahih. Of course, these are the most authentic books. That's fine. We accept that. Now, as a matter of fact, let's see what types of Sahih traditions, according to our Sunni scholars, we have. And so, Sahih traditions, according to the Sunni scholars, could be divided to the following categories. What are these categories? Sahihun shaykhan ala akhrajih. Now, if you want to write, because I haven't translated these. A Sahih tradition that both Muslim and Bukhari have reported it. That means both unanimously have accepted this hadith is Sahih. They have put it in their books. Both of them. Sahihun infarada bi akhrajih al-Bukhari and Muslim. A Sahih which Bukhari has mentioned, Muslim has not mentioned. Either because he did not believe that this is Sahih, or because he thought that this is not important to bring in. Because everyone, when they set out to, to author a book, they will think, okay, what things I should bring in, what should I leave out? So there are many traditions in Bukhari which Muslim does not mention. And there are many traditions which are in Muslim Bukhari does not mention. The third type are Sahihun in Farada bi Ikhrajihi Muslim and Al Bukhari. A tradition that Muslim has mentioned, Bukhari has not mentioned. Now, only these three types we can say that okay, if any hadith is there, is Sahih, if it's not there, is it Sahih or not? No, there are four other types of Sahih traditions. Now what are they? Sahihun ala shartihima ma'an wa lam yukhrijah. When they say Sahih, it, what, does mean, what does it mean when they say Sahih? It means that according to some conditions that we set for ourselves, if a hadith fulfills those conditions, we say that it's Sahih, sound. If it does not fulfill those conditions, we say it's not sound. And then they say, okay, these, if hadith is reported by these reporters, who are both al thiqa al reliable with good memory. We say it's sahih. Now, then the traditions should have met each other or not. Now, if a hadith meets all these conditions, but these two people have not bring it up, later on other scholars have brought it up. So, According to their conditions, the hadith is saying they haven't mentioned it. Why? Because they had a plan for their book. They didn't want just to put everyone as a hodgepodge inside this book. They had a plan for their book, so they didn't bring it. And there, was, there is a sahih which, according to conditions of Bukhari, is sahih. He hasn't mentioned it. Sahihun ala shart al-Bukhari wa ram yukhrajo. Sahihun ala shart muslim wa lam yukhrajo. There is a sahih according to the conditions of Muslim, but he has not bring it in his book. And we have mustatraku sahah Books that were written later saying that these traditions according to the conditions of Bukhari or Muslim were sahih and they did not mention it. And these books are bigger than Bukhari and Muslim. And also, these are the conditions that they have set. There were other scholars which did not accept these conditions. They have other conditions for sahih, for a hadith to be sound. And therefore, there are Sahih traditions which they have not mentioned it. It doesn't meet their conditions, but it doesn't mean that it's not Sahih, it's not sound. So, we cannot say that if a hadith is not in Muslim or in, not in Bukhari, we reject it outright. That means we have to reject nine-tenths of all, the heritage of all traditions that we have. So, add to this, the fact that there are traditions in the two books which allude to the concept is not completely alien. These concepts are not completely alien to Bukhari and Muslim. Now, of course, you might, one might somehow uh, become suspicious of why, for example, they have completely tried to leave out these traditions. 
what was the drive behind it while others regarded these traditions to be sahih. Now, look at this hadith in Bukhari. Does it allude to the fact, to the concept, or it does not? Al-Bukhari rahimahullah fi baab nuzul Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam an Abi Hurairah. They say radiyallahu anha. Qala, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, kayfa antum? إذا نزل ابن مريم فيكم وإمامكم منكم. How will you be when Jesus descends in your midst and your Imam will be from among you? It means you are not, although Jesus descends, but you are not going to pray behind him. You pray behind an Imam of yourself. Now what should be the conditions of that Imam? When Isa alayhi salam is there, the Prophet of God, Ruhullah is there, and still the Muslims pray behind their own Imam. So what are the conditions of that Imam? Is, not, is this not the Mahdi? Certainly it's the Mahdi. And the other hadith, which Muslim reports from Jabir, radiyallahu an, annahu sama'an nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam yaqul, لا تزال طائفة من أمة يقاتلون على الحق ظاهرين إلى يوم القيامة فينزل إيسى بن مريم صلى الله عليه وسلم فيقول أميرهم تعال سلمنا سل لنا فيقول لا أنا بعضكم إن بعضكم على بعض أمراء تكرمة الله هذه وتكرمة لله تكرمة الله لهذه الأمة إيش يقول لها هذه الأمة؟ now the hadith is in Sahih Muslim a group from my ummah will fight for her continuously until the day of judgment it means that there will always be a group in my ummah who are on hak and they fight for it he then said then when they continuously fight for hak are on hak until what then Jesus son of Mary will descend and the leader of my ummah will say now nah, so the ummah has a leader and the leader is from among those who fight for hak and the ummah of my leader will say sorry the leader of my ummah will say come lead us in prayer so he says to Isa alayhi salam come lead us in prayer he says no your Imam is from among yourself. This is how Allah honors this Ummah. And it's very clear. It's very clear that it alludes to someone who is at the caliber of Jesus Christ alayhi salam. Who when Jesus says, no, your Imam is from yourself, Allah has honored this Ummah with an Imam like that, with a, with a leader at the caliber of Jesus Christ, so that the Jesus would pray behind him, rather than he praying behind Jesus. So, this is another issue. And therefore, I don't think there will be any doubts. As I said, the only doubt would be that Muslim and Bukhari have not mentioned traditions of Mahdi, and you would see that they have actually mentioned, and there are many other Sahah books which have mentioned it. Tarmadhi has mentioned it, Abu Dawood has mentioned it, Ibn Majah has mentioned it, Ahmad ibn Hanbal has mentioned it. So, just saying that because these two have not mentioned, we do not accept, it's just a pretext, it's just a sort of accusation against the, uh, the scholars which have accepted the concept. Okay, that's all about it.